Good morning and welcome. We gather as the children of God, holy and dearly loved by our Heavenly Father. We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, for by His grace He has saved us from our sin and given us new life, eternal life. Let's begin our hour with a call to worship from Psalm 145 with me. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. Let's pray. O oh Lord, thank you for your great love for us your bountiful grace that is sufficient, your reassuring mercy that comforts us, and your peace that calms us. We love you and have come to worship you. We will present our prayers and gifts to you. We will open our hearts to receive the teaching of your word by your spirit. And in all this, may you be glorified through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Welcome and thanks for joining us. If you're a guest with us, take a moment and text the word CONNECT to this number to fill out a digital connection card. One of our staff will contact you this week to answer any questions you may have about First Baptist. Also, if you have a prayer request, text PRAYER to the same number and we'll join with you in lifting up your request to the Lord. As a reminder, stay up to date with the latest info from the church, including small group meetings, upcoming events, and ministry activities by visiting our website, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Instagram. Lastly, thank you for giving unto the Lord to support the ministries of First Baptist. Remember, you can mail in your gifts, drop them by, or give online. Now, let's spend a few moments together with the Lord. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Greet the Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray for God's will. Give us this day our daily bread. Pray for God's provisions. Forgive us our trespasses. Confess your sins to the Lord. as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive those who have offended you. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray for God's protection. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Pray that to the Lord. Father, we're grateful for these moments in your holy presence. As we continue our worship of you, be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Please open your Bibles to John 4. We've gone verse by verse through the first 42 verses, seeking to understand why God would inspire the Apostle John to include this true story, the woman at the well, in his gospel. After gleaning some amazing insights about grace and mercy and compassion and love for our enemies, it's quite clear why this story is included and in all that it has to offer. Let's read it one final time together, and then I want to issue a challenge for you. Follow along, John 4, beginning with verse 3. He, that is Jesus, left Judea and departed again for Galilee, for he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, 
Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to Him, Well, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ, and when He comes, He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, am he. Just then his disciples came back. Uh, They marveled that he was talking with a woman, Uh, but no one said, what do you seek? Or, why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Now, for time's sake, go ahead to verse 34 or 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Well, in our time together, I want to teach you how to tell a story. Not a lie. A true story. Think about it. If someone asked you to explain the Bible, you would do so in the form of stories. You would tell the true story of where we came from, how God created the heavens and the earth, the first man and the first woman. You would explain what went wrong, the story of the fall, And how Adam and Eve sinned against God and were cast out of the garden. You would tell the stories of the Old Testament that explain how God chose a people to be his own. And how he led Israel through history. Stories about key figures and their life experiences. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Ruth, Esther, Samuel, David, Daniel, the prophets, the story of Jesus coming, teaching, working miracles, dying on a cross, rising from the dead, the acts of the apostles, true stories that give us the meaning of life and eternity, stories we are to tell everyone, especially our children and grandchildren, that they might know the ways and works of God, that they might know Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the key to eternal life in heaven. I want you to think about the value and the power of a true story from God's inspired word told in your own words. Remember, Jesus taught using stories called parables to make it easier for us to remember the lessons he wanted us to learn. Well, we've now spent three weeks learning the story of the woman at the well. 
I've presented three teachings and 15 daily devotions to complement the teachings. This morning, I'm led to ask you to do something that will greatly enhance your ministry. Would you take the time and make the effort to learn this story so well that you could share it in your own words? And not only share the story, but the invaluable lessons that it teaches us. I'll help you. In your message notes that you can view, download, and print, I've scripted my version of the story that I'm going to share in a moment. I'll also be sharing more about it in our morning video devotions each day this week, so I do hope you'll tune in. The inspiration to do this came last week when I was able to get out on the tennis court and play a good match. When the three others arrived, I was so excited about my morning studies that I shared with them part of this story and one of the lessons I had learned. I marveled that they listened and didn't seem irritated that I was sharing. In fact, later, one of them texted me and told me how much it meant to him. Well, I had shared about the woman's difficult past, having five husbands, going through divorces, and now living with a man. Jesus knew what she had done, and yet he had no difficulty in her witness telling the townspeople that he knew about her failings. And yet she didn't feel ashamed because he had shown her mercy and love. My friend told me about a former marriage that had failed and the guilt that haunted him, the shame he couldn't seem to get past. But that day, this story from God's Word, where I highlighted Jesus' mercy and love, gave him help and hope. So, there you have it. A challenge, uh, an appeal. Learn the story so well that you could tell it in your own words as well as you can tell the story of Noah and the ark, uh, David and Goliath, or Daniel in the lion's den. Add to your repertoire the woman at the well. Here's my version. This is the true story of the woman at the well. Jesus and his disciples were in Jerusalem, but then departed and went north to Galilee. Because the Jews hated the Samaritans, they would walk around the region of Samaria rather than risk having to even see, much less speak to, one of their enemies. But Jesus didn't hate the people, and he wanted to teach his disciples to love them as he did. So he led them through the region. Uh, by noon, they had arrived at a city called Sychar. Outside the city was a well where travelers could replenish the water needed for their journey, uh, for themselves, and for their animals. So Jesus and his disciples took a rest stop there. And the disciples knew they had to go into town and face the people so they could purchase some food. Jesus chose to remain at the well. But the disciples took the bucket needed to retrieve water from the deep well. Fortunately, there was a woman there getting daily water for herself and her family, which was odd because the more reasonable time to go to the well was during the cool of the morning, not at noon's heat. As she retrieves her water, Jesus asks her if she would give him a drink. She's surprised because the Jews hated her and her people also, he was a man, and men didn't speak to women in any public forum in that culture. But Jesus did, because there was something more important than following culture's norms or acting 
on their hatred that his people had for them. He tells her that he can give her living water. Well, that's a reference to eternal life in heaven. Jesus can give it to her. Well, she responds like most of us would, wondering who he was and where would he get that living water. Jesus answers both questions. First, he tells her that what he gives will save her soul for eternity. It will also satisfy the deepest needs and longings in her heart. She wants it. Wouldn't you? The next question is obvious. What could she do to deserve such a gift? But Jesus will help her understand that it's a gift. He gives freely. She can't earn it. No one can earn or deserve eternal life in heaven. But lest she think she can, Jesus will have the very uncomfortable conversation about her sin. He invites her to admit her sin by asking her about her husband. She says that she doesn't have one, and Jesus tells her he knows that she's had a difficult life. She's had five husbands, and the man she's living with now isn't her husband. But there is something in her, like it is in all of us, that she wants to convince Jesus that she's good. So she talks about worship and how she can't get to the temple uh, in Jerusalem to offer sacrifices uh, because the Jews won't let Samaritans go there. Well, Jesus tells her that a time is coming when the temple won't be necessary. The sacrifice of animals for the sins of people will no longer take place. And worship can take place anywhere at any time. It's a foreshadowing of the sacrifice that Jesus will make when he dies on the cross, sheds his blood, and pays the full penalty for the sins of people. After that, no more sacrifices will be needed. She tells Jesus that she knows the Messiah is coming, and when he does, he will tell us everything we need to know. Then Jesus reveals his identity to her. He says, I who speak to you am he. Jesus says that he is the promised Savior of the world, the one who has been sent from heaven to save us from our sins. Well, just as Jesus has revealed this, his 12 disciples return from town with the food they purchased. Well, it's not appropriate for the woman to remain in their midst. Plus, she sees that they're passing through, and if the people in her town are to see and hear Jesus for themselves, they need to come immediately out to the well, or they will miss him. So she leaves her water jar there, so she isn't weighed down by it, because there's something far more important than water. The Messiah has come. So she rushes into town, she tells the people, come and see a man who's told me all that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? What's interesting about her statement is that she no longer feels the shame of her failures and sinful choices. It's probably why she was at the well when no one else was. She felt so ashamed that she didn't want to be around people and feel their judgments but Jesus did not despise and reject her. He spoke to her, knowing what she had done, and offered her eternal life, forgiveness for all she had done wrong. Well, in town, she's so persuasive that the people of the town stop what they're doing at midday and make their way quickly to the well, lest they miss the Messiah. As they appear in the distance, Jesus teaches his disciples that they're seeing the reason he came from heaven to earth. It was for people to save them, to save us. And we need to be saved. 
We can't save ourselves. Well, the people arrive. Jesus speaks with them. And though the Jews and Samaritans are sworn enemies, they invite Jesus and his disciples to stay longer so they can hear more. As Jesus teaches the people what is true and shows them unconditional love, many are drawn to believe in him. Uh, They say, he is indeed the Savior of the world. And I believe that he is, for he has given me living water, eternal life that has begun in my soul and satisfies me. Have you come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and been saved? Well, every time I tell that story, I tell it differently. And you will tell it differently from me, but as long as it aligns with the Scriptures, God will take its truths and minister grace to the hearers. It can open up spiritual conversations that will help someone you care about to understand God's love, understand our sin and need for a Savior, understand grace. It's the gift of eternal life that is given, bestowed. To understand mercy, the forgiveness of all our sins by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And there's more in that story. I hope you'll learn it, practice telling it, and then begin to share it as God gives you the opportunity. So this week I was in the dermatologist's office, and while I was sitting in the exam room, uh, one of the nurses outside was speaking loudly with another woman, and I could hear everything they were saying. They were talking about a patient who had just come in and witnessed to the lady who was speaking. Now, all I heard was her version of their interaction, so I don't know both sides of the story. But she said that the person was a Baptist, and you know what they are like. They have all these rules you have to follow, and they judge you and look down on you. Then the nurse laughed and said she would never be a part of anything like that. She then stated that she was religious and had her own beliefs and didn't need anyone telling her what was true. Plus, all these people want to do is try and control you and tell you what you can and cannot do. (laughs) And she just went on and on. Well, obviously, I felt very sad that they had missed the good news of the gospel. Because the gospel is not what we have done, nor what we can do. It's what Christ has done for us on the cross. So, I did what you would do. I paused and prayed for her and wanted to be open if I might have opportunity to share with her. I sensed that she may be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit for her sin, so she was just reacting to the messenger. I've had that experience before. But for her, the message she heard or misheard was, you are bad and you just need to try harder to be good. And if you come to church, we'll teach you where you're bad and tell you things you can do to try harder to be good. But that is not the gospel. And if you think about it, that isn't good news. Try harder? How is that good news? The gospel message, if you recall from the story, is the gift of eternal life that Jesus imparts, and he can do that through his death and resurrection. John 4, 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he 
would have given you living water. And as we learn from Jeremiah, living water is spiritual and eternal life. And God is the source of it. I mean, think about it. We can't bring ourselves to life spiritually. We must be born again a second time by God's Spirit. And He comes and gives us spiritual and eternal life. Jesus was offering to give her that spiritual life. That is good news. And it would become like a spring of water welling up in her. We'll talk about that this week in the devotion. And that life would last for eternity. That's good news. So, beloved, we have the message of hope the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is good news. And I believe this story of the woman at the well can help us convey that good news. So, I hope you'll learn it, practice it, and begin to use it in your ministry. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving us the gift of eternal life with you. Help us to learn to better share with others this life that we have received, this mercy that has cleansed us from our sins by the cross. Forgive us when we have been hesitant, unprepared, or silent. Compel us by your love and the truth of the gospel so that we will always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ. And if you're listening to this message, you have heard the gospel. I encourage you to pray and express your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll have questions, so ask, seek, seek Him. Don't live another moment without the assurance of your eternal salvation. Thank you for listening. God bless you. The amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of mercy that part with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving God your soul
this life bring suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me, both now and Yo. Yeah. 